NBC University of the Air presents We Came This Way. Stories of the men of yesterday who fought for freedom of the human mind, spirit, and body. With Clifton Utley as the narrator, here is Chapter 12, the story of Lafayette, Lamplighter of Liberty. We Came This Way. In the year 1757, there came into the world a boy, heir to the noble French name of Lafayette. Wealth, court favor were his from birth, for he was the Marquis de Lafayette. Revolution against the English king had begun in America, and by rights, this personable stripling, this nobleman, should have stood in fear of these revolutionary ideas. Instead, he raised his voice and his sword for the new concept of freedom. This boy had a vision. The moment I heard of America, I loved her. The moment I knew she was fighting for freedom, I burned with a desire of bleeding for her. And the moment I shall be able to serve her at any time or in any part of the world will be the happiest one of my life. Fine words, you say? Here was a young man prepared to back them up. Against the orders of the King of France, he obtained the promise of a commission of Major General in the American Army and, leaving his family behind, sailed for America. Call it eagerness, call it the colonists of youth, if you will, but he expected to be received with open arms by the American Congress in Philadelphia. But what happened? Well... In the street, Mr. Saccord? I'm sorry, Marquis, but yes, in the street. So be it. If the Congress wishes to meet me, in the street. Here comes Mr. Lovell now, one of our most distinguished members. Uh, Mr. Lovell, sir. Ah, yes, Mr. Saccord. And this would be... Marie-Joseph Paul is roche Guibert de Métier, Marquis de Lafayette, sir. At your service. I beg your pardon? Marquis de Lafayette. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Congress has considered your petition carefully, Marquis. It seems... I shall consider myself most honored by this commission as Major General in the American Army, sir. The Marquis has come all the way from France at his own expense, Mr. Lovell. I know, I know. But, gentlemen, have you any authority for Mr. Dean? Only his promise, sir, which Congress received with my petition. Uh, yes. Well, to speak frankly, we authorized him to send us four French engineers. But instead, he has sent us some men who pretend to be engineers and some artillerists who have never even seen action. It seems that French officers have a great fancy to enter our service without being invited. But, monsieur... Uh, Congress has asked me to tell you, sir, that now we have experienced men and plenty of them. Good day, sir. <laughs> A less determined man, a prouder man, but evidently Lafayette's devotion was more than an empty boast, and so a letter to Congress. After the sacrifices I have made, I have the right to insist upon two favors. One, to serve at my own cost, and two, to begin my service as a volunteer. A marquee serving in the ranks? Americans admired nerve even then. And so they made him a major general, the highest rank in the American army, a boy of 19. And they gave to General George Washington the thankless task of making use of the untried talents of this persistent youth. Lafayette first met Washington at a dinner given in the general's honor a short time later. General Washington, may I present the Marquis de Lafayette, who, as you know, has lately been added to your command. Marquis, I am honored. It is I, sir, who am deeply in debt. Come, Marquis, we have much to discuss. They have told me of the sacrifices you have made to come to the aid of our cause. It is a cause which the whole world will someday support, sir. Which gives me a view of the noble spirit behind your decision. Please to consider my quarters as your home while you're with us. My family as yours. Thank you, sir. But I must warn you that there's very little of French court life in the privations of a Republican army. I consider the cause worthy of a little discomfort, sir. We shall be embarrassed to be seen by an officer who's just come from the French troops. General Washington, I have come to learn and not to teach. <laughs> 
Washington liked this boy, but what to do with him? A major general in command of a platoon. Things were not going well for the cause of liberty at this time. Lafayette was to know all too well what Washington meant by the privations of a Republican army. Lafayette's career became one long day of battle. At Brandywine, the American army found itself caught between two British divisions and was forced into a retreat that became a rout. Wings on each side have given way, and they're putting all their fire upon us here at the center. The more reason to stand and fire. There are too many for us, sir. Leave our necks, I say. Leave our necks. Sir, you'll make a British target on that horse. Rather that than give way now. Form the battle. I'm with you, sir. Here, here. Okay. Down behind the wagon. Order. Powder and ball. Send some shot this way. Follow me, sir. Cheerate. Fire. <laughs> Oh, oh, he's down. Oh, 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 Help me. Help me on my horse. Oh, General. Hurry, or they'll break again. Yeah. Up, hold the stirrup. There we go. Quickly, Jima. Oh. Voila. The general's up. <laughs> Wounded in his first battle, Lafayette returned to the fight even before his wound was healed. Given charge of a scouting party at White Marsh, he led it with such success that Washington gave him command of a division. And while he fought, Lafayette enlisted, by means of letters, the aid of his friends in high places at the French court. On the 5th of May, 1778, Washington was to learn of the political power of his boy general. In the command hut of General Washington at Valley Forge, the older man called the younger to him to reveal his feelings. Mon General. My dear Marquis, have you heard the news? News, sir. Intelligence has reached me here from Congress that will put this land and its people forever in your debt. Sir, what is it? Our infant nation has made an alliance with your great King of France. France? I knew it, sir. I knew that Frenchmen would waken and make this cause their own. Le bon Dieu has had a hand in this. The Marquis de Lafayette has had a hand in it, too. They speak of God's instruments. Now Frenchmen will know the blessings of liberty, sir, as I have known them. They'll see with their own eyes, as I have seen, what this part does to men's spirits. And perhaps one day they'll know this great privilege for their own. Liberty. Liberty within the law, my dear Marquis. Yes. Liberty within the law. That is a lesson it is good to learn, Mon General. With France committed to the success of his American, Lafayette became a dynamo. In a visit to his native land, he helped to make tangible the French promises, returned to America, and again took up the sword. Now the final chapter of Lafayette's American adventure was at hand. As part of the American army, which gave battle and put to rout the British force under Cornwallis, Lafayette helped to force the British general into a trap at Yorktown. And the victory at Yorktown sent Lafayette back to France to become chief of staff of the combined armies of France and America. There he heard the glad tidings. England had given the colonies their independence. The Marquis dispatched a vessel, fittingly named the Triumph, to bring the news to the America he loved. He continued to work in the interests of America, helping Franklin, Adams, and Jay to borrow money from France. His exploits had won him tremendous popular acclaim, and in spite of the revolutionary ideas, his own class could not resist him. Never did he allow an opportunity to pass to show the French nobility where he stood. But my dear Marquis, you like the present I have prepared for your General Washington, but you dislike the message that goes with it. Why? Your Majesty, these are common words, common phrases for a man of the stature of Washington. These are phrases chosen with the utmost care as suitable for some of the most powerful crowned heads in Europe. They, madam, were only kings. Washington is the general of a free people.
out, Peter Lafayette? Yes, sire. I see you persist in wearing your American uniform. At least tell me now the meaning of the emblem on the belt. That, sire, is the representation of a liberty tree planted on a broken crown and scepter. I see. Coming events were casting their shadows. Europe was a continent that stood on the brink of revolution. And the center of the whirlpool, France. The light that they had seen flare up and become a steady flame in America began to glow fitfully before the opening eyes of the French commoner. One heard this cry in France, and it was led by Lafayette. The notables rather call them the not able. This is no fit body to rule France. Convene the States General. The States General. It had not existed in France for many years. A congress of clergy, notables, and representatives of the people, the States General looked to Lafayette now like an entering wedge toward constitutional government. Elected as a deputy by the notables, he yet fought against them for representation of the people. The States General was convened. On July 11th, with the Assembly Palace surrounded by the soldiers of the king, Lafayette rose and presented a declaration of rights the first proposed in Europe. This declaration printed that night spread like wildfire through Paris. And now the people themselves began to take a hand. Listen to this, citizens. It says for the people to love liberty, all they need is to know it. For them to obtain freedom, all they need is to deserve it. The assembly voted to stay in session day and night until action was taken. Chosen to preside over the deliberations, Lafayette slept in the hall. Rioting broke out in the streets. On July 14th, the mob attacked the great French symbol of oppression, the Bastille. Let us in! Drop the drawbridge! Where is the governor of this rotten prison? There he is. There's Delaney on the top of the tower. People of Paris. People of Paris. I am governor of this prison. My duty to the king demands that I resist any unlawful interest. Your duty is to the people of Paris. With this drawbridge below me raised, you will never be able to enter here. And without some lawful order from the king himself, I shall never give permission to have it lost. Yes, let's walk. Sir, Baron Blanchard should have those chains on the bridge cut in a moment. Myself, I'll drag that dog of a Delaney down from his tower. When the drawbridge falls, I'll drag the tower down brick by brick. My father died in the stinking hole. Be careful of the guards within. They'll fire. Return to your homes. I have ordered the guards not to fire unless attacked. There's nothing to be gained by your threats. A messenger was dispatched from the mob to the States General. Monsieur le Marquis, Monsieur le Marquis. Here, here, Monsieur. Bastille has fallen. The people are pulling it down with their bare hands. Please, Monsieur, please. Let us hear this news. No more will the innocence of France be left to rot in this prison of torture. Monsieur, the will of the people who have elected us makes itself felt for us to follow. Here, Monsieur le Marquis. The people of Paris wish you to have this. What is this, monsieur? 
the key to the Bastille. The key. Washington shall have it. I shall send it to him myself to show him that France is beginning to live the lessons learned from America. We can send him the head of Delaunay as well to show him that France will let nothing... Silence! Murder is not the way to win our ends. Delaunay will be brought to trial. Uh, this trial now, my dear Marquis, can only be in a hot hereafter. On top of a tall pike for all Paris to see, his head rests this very moment. What? Delaunay has been executed for his crime. Delaunay has been murdered for doing his duty to his king. Where were the French guards? They fought beside the people. Is it murder to execute a man? This no. is not the thing we are fighting for. It is the thing we are fighting against. No, no, it is the will of the people. Declare, is right. It's murder. It's justice. Is this the justice we are convened here to ensure for all Frenchmen? Is this the right of fair trial we want guaranteed in our Constitution no. to even the basest criminal? No no, 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 no. How can we ask for ourselves the justice we will not give to others? Frenchmen, this course can only lead to disaster. Mob rule was rising, and Lafayette fought against it with every ounce of his strength. But events rapidly got beyond him. At 3 o'clock, one October morning in 1789, Lafayette went to sleep exhausted after the adjournment for the night of the National Assembly. In the chateau near the Palace of Versailles, he was rudely awakened by startling news. A mob had attacked the king and queen in the palace. Lafayette went at once. Kill them, I say. Kill every one of them. The king guard opposes the will of the people. Cut off the head. Hold! Stand back. It's Lafayette. Leave the Marquis, Lafayette. Monsieur de Marquis, we're showing the king's guard they cannot oppose the will of the people. We'll give you a head for yourself in a moment. Leave them alone, I say. Stand back. Oh. I've pledged my sacred word to the king that no harm shall come to them. Your sacred word? The word of a nobleman. Ah, kill him. Oh. Arrest that man. The Marquis opposes the will of the people. He tell us what to do and what we cannot do. He preaches <laughs> liberty, but does he practice it? Oh. This is not the will of the people. This is the will of the mob. There can be no liberty for any of us unless it is liberty within the law. We are the law. Have you all agreed that you represent the whole of France? Have you made the law that men shall be killed at the whim of a few? The Marquis is right. He's right. This is no law, even of our own making. Let them go. Let them go. Arrest that man. Arrest them. Marquis, Monsieur le Marquis, the grenadiers are formed. A word from you and we'll fire. No hush. Do nothing. Nothing but this rabble. They've attacked the king himself. They are rabble no longer hush. They are people of France. Let them stay here. Keep them in order, but use no force. If you need me, I shall be in the king's apartment. He must show himself to them. It is the Marquis de Lafayette. Let him through. Let him through. Where is the king? He and the queen with the Dauphin are in his apartment, closely surrounded by his guards. You of the National Guard have served well this night. If your king had been murdered... We have sworn to defend his majesty with our lives. Uh, let the Marquis through. My dear Marquis, is this the lot of your king to die at the hands of a howling, bloodthirsty mob? I'm sure that is not their wish, sire. They would have murdered us in our beds. Were it not for your national guards, we would have been corpses now. And my child here with us. I'm sorry, sire. And madam. I order you to have the national guard drive them out. Arrest the leaders and hang them for treason. No, sire. You refuse? Yes, sire. The National Guards have saved your lives tonight. But it is you who must save your throne. My throne? Sire, these people are torn between their love for you and their concern at your lack of interest in their cause. But, but... Can... Show yourself to them, and they'll be satisfied they are mistaken. Step out on this balcony. Monsieur Le Marquis would see us murdered. Trust me, madam. Open the doors to the balcony. Sire. Now send four members of your guard onto the balcony. You have heard the Marquis? Go. Yes, sire. My dear Marquis, you profess to understand this rabble better than I do. But if my men should die because of it... Oh, the king's guard! Oh, the king's guard! It, it cannot be. Madam, will you step out with me? You're being called by your people. The Dauphin. Shall I bring the Dauphin? Hold him in your arms as you are. Here now. Courage. They hate me. All of them. But I know my place. 
Bucky. One fellow down there is pointing a gun at me. He'll... Say, he'll not fire. I guarantee it. Let me kiss your hand. Chivalry at a moment when... Oh, Sire, they call. What have you done to them? They came to kill in the state to pay their respects. What is this talk of Paris? They want you near them, sire. Speak to them. But raise your hand and they'll listen. A few moments ago, they would have... The people of France, the voice of all of you, I hear raised in the voices of you few below me here. You ask me to come to Paris. The Queen, the Dauphin, and I will come. I trust myself and my most precious possessions to the love of my dear and faithful subjects. Marquis, you have saved our lives. Sire, you have saved your throne. I have only saved your lives to try and save France. But all of Lafayette's personal power could not stave off the end for long, nor the anarchy that followed. Lafayette was forced to flee for his life when the Jacobins came into power, preaching death for all nobility. Captured by the Austrians as he fled toward America, Lafayette languished for five long years in prison while all of Europe burst into flames. His release secured by Napoleon, Lafayette remained out of politics. Now the Bourbons regained the throne, and Lafayette planned with other freedom-minded Frenchmen to overthrow the despotic king. The plan was discovered, the leaders hanged, and Lafayette's part in the affair revealed, but he was never brought to trial. The power of this man's integrity, the knowledge that he had fundamental right on his side, saved him even from those who took the opposite view. Time went on, and at the age of 67, he found himself with the leisure to visit America again. Congress sent him a formal invitation, and the old freedom fighter stepped off the boat at New York's battery to the acclaim of 30,000 people. He was welcomed by the mayor of the city of New York. In the name of the municipal authorities of this city, I come to offer you sincere congratulations at the moment when you arrive in a country which regards you as one of the most honorable and most beloved founders of its liberty and its happiness. From New York, a trip by coach up and down the eastern seaboard. Uh, hold on there, Charlie. Whoa, hold on there, boy. Well behave eh? You are going to carry the greatest man in the world. Get it, Bab. Hey, toll gate ahead. Oh, Charlie, toll it, toll it, toll it. Toll it. Go ahead, the road's free. General Lafayette travels today, and no man shall pay toll. Everywhere, the grand old man was acclaimed. Banquets, gifts, expressions of appreciation along the whole 600-mile route. At Mount Vernon, Lafayette spent a few quiet moments at the tomb of his great General Washington. And then, before Congress assembled, the Marquis de Lafayette made his speech of well in reply to the welcome by Henry Clay. With tears in his eyes, he spoke. The approbation bestowed by the American people and their representatives upon my conduct during the vicissitudes of the European Revolution is the greatest recompense that I could receive. In truth, I can stand firm and direct when in their name, Mr. President, you solemnly declare that on every occasion I have remained faithful to those principles of liberty, equality, and of true social order to which I consecrated my youth and which till my death will be for me a sacred duty. We can
came this way, Americans. We came the way of freedom for the body, mind, and spirit of man, and achieved the final goal because of the strength and vision of men like Lafayette. Though he failed to build in Europe the free world he had helped to found in America, he laid there the foundations of that world for those who came after. A larger share of greatness is his due because the thing he sought for others was not something he had need of himself. Right was right for itself alone more truly than for many others who have labored on the world of liberty. We Americans can pattern our actions after Lafayette toward freedoms not yet won. And looking back at the life he lived, say truly, we came that way. The NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 12 of the new historical series, We Came This Way, episodes on the high road to human freedom. We feel that you will enhance your pleasure and profit from this series if you make use of the special handbook which we have prepared to accompany it. You can obtain the handbook by sending 25 cents in cash to cover cost of printing and mailing to We Came This Way, Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. Tonight's script was written by Hugh Chain and directed by Mr. Homer Heck. The original music is composed by Dr. Roy Shield, and the orchestra was directed by Mr. Joseph Galicchio. The members of the cast were Mr. Clifton Utley as narrator, Mr. William Everett as Lafayette, and Mr. Fred Sullivan as George Washington. Others in the cast were Miss Nanette Sargent, Mr. Wilms Herbert, Mr. Charles Eggleston, Mr. Haskell Coffin, Mr. Sid Elstrom, Mr. Gilbert Ferguson, Mr. Paul Hughes, and Mr. Armand Hunter. This is the National Broadcasting Company.